Tonight we're fortunate enough to have with us uh, Paul Street. And Paul is a visiting professor in American history at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois. He's the author of three books and more than 150 articles and numerous book chapters and project studies on a range of topics, which include labor history, corporate propaganda, welfare reform, political finance, racism, racial segregation, education policy, mass incarceration, imperialism, thought control, and labor market inequality. Broad range of topics that he can and will speak on this night. His most recent book is called Segregated Schools, Educational Apartheid in Post-Civil Rights America. And the book that interest, introduced me to his work is called e uh, Empire and Inequality, America and the World Since 9-11. And in that book, he says this, 9-11 was a great opportunity for concentrated economic and political power to advance intimately related projects of empire and war abroad and inequality and repression at home. In the end, the tragedy would serve to legitimize a dangerous and illegitimate president who was captive to multinational petroleum and military corporations whose policies are largely to blame for the Middle East quagmire that gave rise to 9-11. It is the structurally, and this is where the media part fits in for us, the structurally encoded role of the mainstream corporate media to discourage Americans from really thinking about these and other things. So with that, I invite and welcome Paul Street to the podium, please. He's going to speak about an hour, and then we're going to take Q&A. And if people do, just raise your hand, and I'm going to come around with a mic so we can get this on tape. Okay. Hi there. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, so nice to be preceded by Bob Dylan. I'm uh, in the middle of teaching a class right now, uh, America since the 1960s, and we've uh, been listening to a little uh, Dylan, uh, particularly uh, a song called Masters of War, which came out in um, 62, the same year as the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, where Dylan says, you fasten the triggers for the others to fire, and you sit back and watch while the death count gets higher. You hide in your mansions while young people's blood flows out of their bodies and gets buried in the mud. One of many lines in this particular song that have always struck with me, uh, I don't know if it's the greatest anti-war song of all time, uh, certainly one of them. Uh, and thanks again, Jeff, for inviting me to speak. I, I want to talk tonight about um, um, what is really one of the biggest themes in my writing, uh, which is the conflict between militarism and social and spiritual health um, in the nation. Uh, and since I'm in a Republican district, everyone told me, I said, I was going up to Grand Rapids, and everybody said, Gerald Ford. <laughs> they said, that's where Gerald Ford comes from, which is different than uh, you know the, 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 the early 21st century Republican Party in some ways, I suppose. So I'm in a Republican district. I probably don't have many uh, Republicans in the audience uh, tonight, would be my guess, though. Uh, let me start by saying that um, a conflict between uh, military expenditure and social spending and health uh, in the United States is uh, and al it always has been and remains to this day uh, a rich bipartisan affair, a uh, richly bipartisan problem. It became especially prominent during the 40s uh, for the first time really in American history when uh, Democratic, okay, uh, uh, Roosevelt and then Truman administrations oversaw the rise of a permanent war economy and the rise of what the Republican, right, President uh, Dwight Eisenhower famously, famously labeled, um, referred to, I don't know if he actually came up with the term, the military industrial. Uh, some of you may recall um, the great civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr. speaking and writing, or, well, you're not going to recall this, uh, some of you personally because you weren't there, but perhaps you've read the essential writings and the essential uh, uh, speeches of King from the mid, uh, late 1960s. If, you, if you've encountered him uh, in that period of time talking about what he called the triple evils that are interrelated, militarism, poverty, and racism. Um, I can never again raise my voice, King said in 1967, against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the uh, greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. That's a quote from King. 
1967 at Riverside Church uh, in New York City, uh, explaining his great step that he took, that he took a lot of criticism for from within his own civil rights community, uh, speaking openly about the Vietnam War and to start making all the connections between the struggle for black equality uh, with the struggle for economic justice and with increasingly uh, in the mid and late 60s in King's rhetoric and discourse with the, uh, with, with the criticism of the war and more broadly than that militarism and imperialism and all those types of things. Uh, King was moved to break his silence, he said, on Vietnam by allegiances and loyalties which are broader and deeper than nationalism. Uh, his Christian humanist values, he explained, meant that he could not watch passively as, quote, we poison the Vietnamese people's water as we kill a million acres of their crops, as we send them into hospitals with at least 20 casualties from American firepower for every one quote unquote Viet Cong inflicted injury. Uh, the people of Indochina, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, said, must find Americans to be strange liberators indeed, he said, as we destroy their families and their villages and their crops. Uh, and then King would focus back on the home front and he would, um, he, would, he would talk about the fact that many young black Americans and poor whites were in Vietnam because their poverty was so high, right, and their job prospects were so low that enlistment in the military looked like a step uh, up to them. A lot of these things, when you, when you, it's interesting when you read King and you, actually when you study the Vietnam War, so many things resonating with issues we have going on right now. Uh, similar, different, but, but lots of parallels between Vietnam and a, and Iraq. He observed that the American government's resort to mass bloodshed to violence uh, in Southeast Asia was undermining his ability to argue effectively for nonviolent activism at home. King was always trying to talk people in urban environments into not just, you know, resorting initially, <laughs> well, resorting at all in his case, to, to violence. And, and, and one of his key points uh, was how am I supposed to say that violence isn't the solution to problems when the, Uncle Sam himself is saying in, in, in regard to Southeast Asia that's exactly what. Uh, what the tactic ought to be uh, used, that, that violence is a solution. Uh, and he noted that the government's decision to pour tens of millions of dollars into uh, what Noam Chomsky used to refer to as the crucifixion of Southeast Asia, um, you know, it, 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 this, this extraordinary assault that killed more than two million Vietnamese. Uh, and he said that this was undercutting uh, uh, his ability to deliver on the promissory note of social justice. What King said was the, the, the enormous amount of money we're spending in Vietnam was making it uh, impossible for Uncle Sam to deliver on the promissory note of social justice it had started to write with its briefly declared uh, war on poverty in the 60s. With the resources accruing from the end of the war, from the end of an arms race, and from the end of what King referred to as excessive space races in the 60s. In the 60s, we were all just we were obsessed with how we were going to land on the, on the moon. Um, uh, King said, uh, if, we, if, if we could save all that money, we'd be able to eliminate all poverty, and it would be, that would become, in, the end of poverty would become an immediate national reality. And at present, King bitterly observed the war on poverty is even a battle. It's uh, scarcely even a skirmish. So defense expenditures in Vietnam, King knew, were strangling um, the war on poverty in its cradle. Um, and thinking about all of this and making all these kinds of connections between, between racial injustice inequality and economic injustice inequality and militarism and empire and the, and the social costs, the domestic costs, the homeland costs of uh, military expenditures, King ended up calling by 1960 for what he referred to as a radical reordering uh, of the nation's priorities. And he started referring to the nation's priorities as, as being perverted Priorities. This, this recurs again and again in his talks. He's starting to, to refer to the United States as a sick country. He tells Abernathy, you know, we live in a sick nation. We have and, and we have we have perverted ideas of of, uh, of how we invest our public dollars. Uh, and by '67, he goes public with his determination that the reordering he's talking about required would require a whole a restructuring of the whole of American society. There are 40 million poor people here. And one day, King said, we must ask the question, why? And then King said, when you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalistic economy. Something is wrong with capitalism, King felt. 
uh, when it was more profitable to invest in napalming South Vietnamese villages and children and to invest in building new weapons of, uh, of nuclear annihilation. It was more profitable to invest in that than it was in America's own forgotten inner cities. Um, there was something really, really perverse, King felt, about a society where just gigantic, soulless corporations, uh, you know, these corporations, just the creations, but sort of Frankenstein creations and masters of capitalism at uh, one and the same time. Uh, there's something wrong in a society where those sorts of entities influence policy to privilege militarism and empire and death over community and over justice and health. Uh, and, and, and health. And in his last and most radical presidential address before the Southern Christian Leadership Council, King made some very deep historical connections between each of his triple evils, right? Uh, 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 economic exploitation being one, racism being the other, and militarism being uh, the third. A nation that will keep in slavery people for 250 years, he said, will thingify them. It will make them things. Therefore, they will exploit them, and poor people generally economically, and a nation that will exploit economically will have to have foreign investments and everything else. It have to use its military might to protect them. All of these problems are tied together, King said. And for King, empire and inequality, materialism and racism, uh, and he said explicitly capitalism, were all inseparably bound up with each other as part of the same uh, deadly complex of soulless social uh, injustice. Uh, in his statements to the SCLC, uh, very close to the end of his life, echoed his comments at Riverside Church in New York in 67, where he called for the U.S. to, quote, get on the right side of the world revolution by beginning the shift from a thing-oriented to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, King declared, uh, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. Uh, King was driven to these conclusions and in, in, incidentally, uh, uh, interestingly enough, to endorse what he referred to as democratic socialism. Um, it's worth noting, I think, when Democrats uh, controlled all three branches of the federal government, you know, at the height of uh, the liberal New Deal democratic consensus in the um, mid-late 1960s. A consensus, of course, it was unraveling as, as he spoke. Um, and, and all of which, you know, flash forward now, in looking at the 21st century and thinking about our current situation. Um, you know, an obvious question arises, how do the nation's priorities stand today? Uh, where are we? Where are we? Um, this is a big question in Chicago right now. We're having a lot of these sort of 40-year assessments because it turns out 65 and 66 are the four decade, the four 40-year anniversaries of the Chicago Freedom Movement. When King said, okay, enough with the South, we did that. That was actually relatively easy. Now it's, gonna, now it's the serious stuff. We're going to tackle social and economic injustice in the entire country, including the North, of course. Uh, well, here we are, 40 years later, uh, more than 36 million residents of the country, uh, of the United States, which uh, U.S. Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson uh, likes to call the beacon to the world of the way life should be. I love that phrase. She said, uh, Kaylee Bay Hutchinson said that uh, in a speech they gave to the U.S. Senate in, er in early 03, the one where they, they gave uh, W, you know, a check to do what he needed to do in Iraq. And she said, you know, we're the beacon to the world of the, of the way life should be. Well, more than 36 million residents in the United States uh, in the beacon of the world uh, languish beneath the federal government's uh, notoriously low poverty level. Uh, it was $14,680, okay, for a family of three uh, a couple of years ago, and it hasn't gone up much since. The poverty level is just, it's a crazy thing. I, I'm in a, involved in a lot of debates about what the poverty level uh, ought to be. It goes back to the 50s where they actually plugged in the federal, uh, the FDA's uh, formula for a minimum adequate food budget, and they multiply it by three. That's how they come up with this thing. You know, I defy anyone, I'm from Chicago metro area, I defy anybody to, uh, to successfully sustain a family of, uh, of three yeah, in Chicago on, uh, you know, $15,000 a year. Um, more than 11 million or 17% of the children 
live below the poverty level and the U.S. child, child poverty rate is substantially higher than that of other industrialized nations. More than one in three U.S. kids lives in or near poverty and more than eight million Americans live in homes that frequently skip meals or eat too little. Uh, suicide takes the lives of 30,000 Americans each year. Uh, it's a high-ranking cause of death for 10 to 14-year-olds, 15 to 19-year-olds, and 20 to 24-year-olds uh, in the beacon to the world um, of the way life should be. We did this uh, big study, which just came out last uh, June, uh, under the uh, aegis of my old employer, the Chicago Urban League, where I was the research director, right? middle of the south side of Chicago at 45th and Michigan Avenue for, uh, for five years. It's called Still Separate Unequal Race, Place, Policy, and the State of um, Black Chicago. And I won't hit you with all the findings there because as you see it, all, it grew, the whole thing grew to a, a book length. Uh, but for example, I found uh, 15 Chicago neighborhoods in, 19, uh, in 1999 where more than a quarter of the kids um, we're living at less than a half of, the, um, of this kind of increasingly laughable and inadequate and tragically low poverty level. Um, and that was at the peak of the Clinton boom, okay? When you're, I deal a lot with 2000 census data, and when you're citing stuff from the 2000 census, uh, you're actually talking about 1999. So we had at the peak, okay, this is at the best it's been, okay, the longest peacetime expansion in post-World War II America, uh, there were 15 neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. Uh, there are 77 neighborhoods total, statistically. Chicago's weird. It's, the neighborhoods are broken down very specifically and have been since the 1920s. You can really measure things very precisely. And 15 neighborhoods. Um, we had 15 neighborhoods where more than half of the kids were poor, which didn't surprise me so much. But the 15 neighborhoods where, where you have more than a quarter of the kids at less than half of the poverty level. Okay, so family of four. I mean, you're in families where the total income is, uh, is less than like $8,000. I found one neighborhood in Chicago on the far south side where 50% of the kids, where more than 50% of the kids were in deep poverty. It's this new term now among poverty researchers, deep poverty. Because you, know, you, you, know, you just hear about poverty levels. That's bad enough, but, but, but there's a, they, they have to measure how extreme the poverty is. And so now we have this phrase called, uh, we have this phrase called uh, deep poverty. Um, here in Grand Rapids, uh, and I looked it up before I came up here, I found in the, it's real easy, there's this thing, the Fact Finder, www Fact Finder, the, the whole, you, you can find this, you get these spreadsheets on every community, it's amazing, in, in, in the country. Uh, one in five kids uh, in 1999, okay, in the 2000 census, lived in poverty. Uh, there were 14,000 people in Grand Rapids in 1999 at the peak of the Clinton boom. Uh, living in deep poverty, okay, at less than half of uh, the poverty level. More than 42 million Americans lack health coverage. Uh, the beacon uh, is still um, the only, I'm going to put that down there because it's getting in the way, that book, uh, is the only modern industrialized state, okay, without a universal socially inclusive health insurance plan. Um, nearly two-thirds of the homeland's populace, okay, America's populace, actually supports a universal system that would provide health coverage to everyone, but that's sort of neither here nor there uh, in terms of policy. But a lot of issues on that, by the way. One of the things that's really shocked me, one of the astonishing things about contemporary United States society, as I've been, I've been following events over the last few years, is this disconnect between what you read you, you know, you, you, you hear these issued uh, uh, responses to polling questions, and people are on issues sound amazingly progressive and left-wing and sort of social democratic and European, and it has nothing to do with anything that's being said by candidates in election or that's actually being implemented uh, in terms of policy. I want to, just, it's just one of many examples, uh, but the healthcare thing is one that's really graphic, okay? I mean, the preponderant majority of, of the adult population supports some kind of socialized health healthcare system, guaranteed national healthcare system for the people, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's not that they don't get it, it's not that they're for it, it's something else. There's this, this kind of disconnect between what, what people want uh, and what what they'd be willing to actually fight for and do. I mean, so it's one thing to say something to a pollster, right? And it's another thing to actually. So I would sort of joke with my history classes that maybe they could have 
the American Revolution, they just had Gallup, you know, they could have just, just have approval, you know, King George's approval ratings after the T Act, you know, because, you know, the T Act uh, didn't turn out, everyone would be like, that's it, that's great, we showed them, right? We, 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 they got a, a 20% approval rating on the T Act, right? So they don't have to have the Boston Tea Party, right? And then the guy, the guy that dressed up like an Indian and jumped, you know, and threw all the tea in the harbor, I mean, he, they just, Dr. Phil would talk to him, right? You know, what, what were you thinking? What were those issues that you had? What was wrong with your family that made you do all that kind of stuff? Um, even though it's the second richest country, everyone's saying America's the richest country, actually per capita, Norway's number one. I hope it doesn't offend any patriots out there. So it looks like we're number two, okay? Even though it's the, world, the second richest country in the world after Norway in terms of per capita wealth, the U.S. ranks number 24 um, in terms of life expectancy. There's a lot of health data been coming out in the, in the last few years, and that's one that stuck out, stuck out to me and stood out to me. Uh, and part of the explanation for why we might be the, the second richest country in the world, if you want us to be the richest country in the world because Norway's so small, okay? Uh, richest country in the world, but 24 life expectancy. Uh, part of the explanation that lay in the astonishing um, over, well, that's a value statement, I guess I say, I say over, I, I'll admit it, I, I, I think this is too much, this astonishing over-concentration of wealth in America, where the top 1% owns more than 40% of the t wealth, the top 10% owns more than two-thirds of wealth in the beacon to the world of the way life should be. And the rest of us has 90% to fight it out, right, for uh, one-third of the nation's net worth. And, of course, things get a lot worse when you factor in race. One of the most astonishing statistics uh, I've run across in recent years, and it's a very re reputable statistic, some big-name economists, uh, one of them, Tom Shapiro out of Brandeis, um, is this one. By 1999, uh, Shapiro found out. Uh, Shapiro and a guy named Melvin Oliver have done some really pioneering research in the last few years on, it, it, you don't get any sense of, you don't get the full sense of income, uh, of class and race disparity in the country if you just do income. What you really get is when you do wealth, okay, and total assets, right, net worth. Uh, Shapiro found by the end of the 20th century um, that the net worth of typical white families in America was 81,000 compared to eight thousand for black families. Okay, that's, that's 10 black cents on the white dollar. And by 2002, thanks to recession, he found that black net worth fell to seven cents um, on, uh, on the white dollar. And by the way, those 15 neighborhoods of the, that I mentioned before in Chicago, where a, more than a quarter of the kids are living at less than half the poverty level, all but one of them uh, are very preponderantly African American, and in Chicago, uh, just place and race go together. So, so as in other cities, I'm mean, not getting me wrong, uh, that you really, you know, you, you you can just when you say West Side and you say South Side, and that's where those neighborhoods are. That's where those neighborhoods are all at extreme poverty. The only exception was the near North Side, which it seems counterintuitive because you've got some rich condo developments up there, but it made it in at like number 14 on that ranking simply because it still has the Cabrini Green housing project on the near North Side which all the real estate developers are licking their chops and wanting to get rid of and put up, you know, expensive condos for people to work downtown and so they can walk to work. That's the big thing. And we're real excited in Chicago. We're a global city now. Our, our downtown corporations are somehow globally connected. And we have all these rich people that want to live within walking distance. And we're kicking all these other people out. So that's why that neighborhood uh, got in. A uh, fascinating series uh, came out in the New York Times last spring. Uh, and as the Times acknowledged, uh, I think it was in April, in a front page story, which had this interesting title, Life at the Top Isn't Just Better, It's Longer. <laughs> Not only do the rich live better, but they live more, right? And as, as the Times points out in this article, quote, class is a potent force in health and longevity in the United States. The more education and income people have, the less likely they are to have and die of heart diseases, strokes, diabetes, many types of cancer, and so on and so forth. Upper middle class, as the Times report, live longer and in better health than middle class Americans who live longer and better than those at the bottom, and the gaps are widening. Uh, so the people, uh, and, and the gaps are widening. As advances in medicine and disease prevention have increased life expectancy in the United States, the Times reported the benefits have disproportionately gone to people with education. 
money, good jobs and connections. They're almost invariably in the best position to learn new information early, to modify their behavior, to take advantage of the latest treatments, and have uh, health costs covered by insurance. So you get in a place like Chicago or Detroit, and you just go to neighborhoods where people Conditions just go on and on and on. They don't have regular doctors. Whole neighbors in Chicago where people, they, they try and use the Jewel and Osco Pharmacy, okay, as doctors and the local emergency rooms and hospitals sort of service people with flus and colds and stuff like that. You know, and you drive around whole neighbors, doctor's offices, you don't see groceries, regular stand-up uh, full-service grocery stores, you don't see sit-down restaurants, you don't see coffee shops, and stuff, but you don't see doctors and, and things like that. If you break down uh, the mortality stats by race and class, you find that blacks and poor people live considerably shorter lives on average than affluent and white people. Uh, unequal health care contributes to more than 100,000 black Americans dying earlier than whites each year. Um, Middle-aged black men die at twice the rate as white men of a similar age. According to former U.S. Surgeon General David Satcher, in a very important article that was published in the um, March-April issue of Health Affairs, and this is interesting, it was published just as the country was getting ready, ready the media was getting ready to just go completely nuts about Terry Schiavo. Uh, and according to Satcher, um, Elimination of this racial gap in, in quality of health coverage would prevent an estimated 84,000 early deaths each year. And it's just a whole other bunch of reasons. The last year, for some reason, was a very big year in the publication of research about racial health disparities. We found out that black infant mortality, infant mortality is two and a half times higher than that of white infant mortality, and so on and so, so forth. Um, I did, in the research that I did on Chicago, uh, we found that predominantly white northwest siders uh, uh, expect to live to, can expect to live to 75 to 80 years old. Predominantly black south siders have a life expectancy of around 60 years. Black men die at a rate twice the rate, uh, double the rate of white men in Chicago. Do you know I found this out and did not realize this until late in our research in Chicago because of particularly early black uh, male mortality and also incarceration, the female population within the black community is like 30% bigger than the black population. I said, well, that's just Chicago. And then this guy, Mawakil, did a piece in the community. Mm -hmm. said, across the board, they're in the American cities, there's these astonishing gaps uh, among adults in the number of people that are actually biologically alive in the black community with the, with the male population way, way down. Uh, the death rate for black women is nearly twice that of white women in Chicago. 13 of the city's top 15 neighborhoods for HIV mortality are disproportionately black for the city. One of the really interesting, uh, well, interesting is the wrong word, disturbing findings we had in our research about Chicago is counterintuitive. They're HIV, and they go right to gay neighborhoods, and they think of the north side, and they think of neighborhoods around Wrigley Field up there. And by 2000, by the 2000 census, HIV, AIDS, Mortality has really migrated into the predominantly black sections of Chicago. I can't speak for other cities, but I'm assuming similar um, things are going on. Uh, of the top 15 neighborhoods for heart disease mortality, 12 are very disproportionately black. Uh, 10 are at least 94% black. Uh, lower black income, lower access to health care, differential neighborhood quality, uh, residential race segregation, all these things combine to, cre these, to create these kind of uh, health disparities. Uh, and if you're looking for an instructive exercise, do a domestic version of something that Noam Chomsky is always talking about in, in terms of foreign policy, right? This distinction between worthy and unworthy victims, right? If someone's a, a victim, uh, but they happen to be with a government that's on our side, we give them a whole bunch of attention, and if they're, 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 they're affiliated with a movement or a state that we're against and they're victimized and they, they sort of don't exist or you have to read about them on page 30. Well, if you're interested in that worthy versus unworthy victims distinction, do a LexisNexis or a Yahoo or a Google search to determine which issue receives uh, more media attention in the U.S. during the last year. Uh, this really heavy toll of uh, premature black mortality uh, or the death of one white woman named Terry uh, Schiavo, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm aware that, that how and why the Schiavo thing became what it became had, had more, had, had to do with a whole, a whole bunch of things. But the Christian, uh, and I put that in quotes, right to life crowd 
just hasn't gotten around yet to making a national, quote unquote, moral issue uh, out of the first problem. One of the things that really amazed me in this last election in 04 was this, 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 the way the media sort of played along with this, of, 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 of this label moral issue, right? I mean, get, get basically gay marriage, right? And then, you know, women's choose and sort of uh, personal morality issues and, and sexual, sexual conduct, sexual behavior sorts of issues. Those are moral issues. But, you know, more than a million black kids in the country, the Children's Defense Fund reported in 03, more than a million black kids in deep poverty, half the poverty level. Uh, is that a moral issue? Is, is 1% owning 40% of the wealth in the country, is that a moral issue? Uh, 42 million plus or whatever the latest count is of people uninsured. I mean, a lot of moral issues. It's sort of interesting the way we, and I even sort of heard people on the left going, well, you know how they did it, you know how the right did it this time, is, you know, they used moral issues. <laughs> Wait a minute, you're even buying into this definition of what, you know, meaning gay marriage primarily. So you're buying into this definition of what a moral uh, issue is. Also, I didn't think the gay marriage issue was as big a, big a deal, the moral issues as, I, I still thought 04 was very much a 9-11 election. It was very much the, the p pushing the panic button and, and using national security fears, but I'm sort of going off on a tangent uh, there. Uh, I could, you know, really go on. The, li the list of unmet American um, social needs is just endless. Uh, the, the, the record of public disregard for unworthy victims, okay, of domestic homeland, uh, race and class inequality um, um, is just really um, a voluminous. I mean, I've just seen, that's one of the things that I said to people, how did you write so many articles in the last five years? I just was in a position where the data that was flowing across my desk was just, was just no stop. I mean, and, you know, I was just by virtue of my position, I didn't have to buy all these journals. I mean, they just be delivered to me. They'd show up in the mail. I had to go through my for the for the first hour, and then I'd be in everyone's email databases, and I would just this litany, you know, of horror of inequality was just the first two hours of every day, and so I was just to pick and choose your your uh, your miserable statistic. Now, to a longtime poverty and race researcher like me, uh, it was a little strange to see uh, the nation really jolted more than anything I, I've never seen people making connections between race and poverty and even to some extent militarism um, more than they have in the, in the last couple months because of Katrina I mean it's the, 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 it's the biggest sort of discussion I've seen that publicly about that since the 60s with the race riots in Vietnam going in at the same time to a longtime researcher of all this kind of stuff like me for whom none of this is really new it was kind of bittersweet uh, to see the nation just jolted by Katrina into a um, this kind of like in, you know kind of surprised discussion of uh, poverty and race um, at uh, most immediate level, uh, New York Times acknowledged uh, on September 9th that quote race and class were the unspoken markers of who got out and who got stuck in New Orleans and. Two days after that, the Times reporter, um, Jason DeParle, who's a very good domestic uh, issues uh, reporter for the Times, uh, wrote an interesting column, right? Okay, this is on, nine, on September 11th, 2004, on the fourth anniversary of 9-11, and DeParle observed that uh, what a shocked world saw exposed in New Orleans last week wasn't just a broken levee, it was a chasm of race and class. Um, at once familiar and yet startlingly new, laid bare in a setting where they suddenly, where they suddenly, where race and class suddenly amounted to matters of life and death. Hydrology joined sociology through the storyline, from the settling of the flood-prone city where well-to-do white people lived on the high ground to its frantic. Um, uh, but you know, race and class have always been matters of life um, and death in America. Uh, Katrina just provided, I thought, an especially graphic and unavoidable illustration um, of the basic fact that a lot of us have been studying for a long time, that American societal uh, arrangements and, and, and institutional uh, 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 hierarchies, you know, apportion freedom. Uh, you know, which is this term that uh, freedom that Bush just just beats to death, uh, but never bothers to define. You know, and whose limits and complex and and contested meanings 
uh, he of course you know just never appreciates. But but that we 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 distribute freedom. I mean, literally, it's freedom to get away from a natural disaster, right? Um, and all kinds of other ways, and you know that we distribute that in very racially and socioeconomically selective and unequal ways. We all know who got left behind, okay, from Bush's, um, uh, excuse me, the to rot in uh, in that living hell that New Orleans became for those uh, few days. Uh, one of the most interesting and revealing um, terms I saw in the media coverage, and since we've got me talking about free, uh, Katrina. And the media, there's an article I did out there on the table, which is a more comprehensive account. Um, one of the most uh, revealing and I thought interesting themes that I saw over and over again was, um, I can't count how many times I heard reporters say, this can't be America. It's more like a third world nation. It's like Bangladesh or Baghdad. I mean, I literally heard that about, about 10 times. Uh, and this comment, um, to me, I thought sort of minimized uh, extreme levels of inequality and poverty and disparity and public sector, starvation, uh, and all that kind of stuff, which had uh, really created, uh, I don't want to say third world, but, but, but certainly sub-first world okay, conditions in black communities uh, across the country for, for a very long time. I mean, pretty much what King used to talk about, this, this, these triple evils that are uh, interrelated. And just, you know, you see people, oh my God, you know, the Louisiana National Guard was over in Iraq and the Mississippi, or a good chunks of them were over there. It was, just, it was just exactly what King was talking about, right? We had people of exactly the types of skill sets and the abilities and the capacity to save people off of rooftops and they're not even available, they're over there. I mean, it's a very, seemed very, 60s like to me in, in, in various kinds of ways, right? Um, and, but the thing that got under my skin and bugged me about it, and I actually heard a quote from Barack Obama that I thought was really sort of, because I, I sort of, I often sort of have these criticisms that I make on Zenit and other places sort of of Obama from his left. But it was, Obama, I said, thought something that was really, you know, and we're all excited in Chicago, the community I came out of there, you know, just, you gotta love Obama, just like everything he says, right? But, but he said something that I thought was really sharp, which is it's, it's kind of a damn shame. Uh, it took a, a hurricane to expose the fact that people are living under these kinds of conditions. They've been, he said, I've been talking about it for a, a very um, long time. So I don't know. That's sort of my bit on, uh, on Katrina um, media coverage. So, you know, how, um, how does the government in the beacon to the world of the way life should be, uh, K. Bailey Hutchins' discover, uh, description of the United States. How is the beacon's national government, uh, how has it been responding to all this inequality and this poverty and this inequity uh, and these issues that I have been uh, focused on, I suppose some people might say over-focused on for the last few years professionally. It's really sort of been my job to study uh, this stuff. Well, it's, 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 um, it's more than a generation after King's assassination. Um, um, and, and King is this sort of iconicized, but sort of defanged hero, right? Where the, every, even the white kids in the Chicago area suburbs and everyone's just listening to the I Have a Dream speech, and he's in all the history textbooks. And, but he's sort of this, he's been sort of turned in this kind of safe guy who, who beat. Bull Connor and spoke at Washington D.C. in '63 and basically just wanted civil rights. He said, "Leave out the the the, the whole legacy, right?" Which the guy called himself a democratic socialist by '67, and was connecting all the dots: race with class, with with poverty, and not just black poverty, but the poverty of poor whites, with militarism, which he's starting to refer to as imperialism. And he's starting to wrap it all up as part of uh, capitalism in a way. And what I see uh, his, is his real legacy is just being disgraced. Um, by a government that, that prioritizes militarism over uh, social provision and health like no time in uh, recent memory, like no time that we've um, ever seen. Uh, as of December 21st, 2004, the National Priorities Project reported uh, Bush administration's imperial war of choice and you know brazenly imperial war of choice in Iraq had cost more than 151 billion okay and that was coming up on a year ago so we know it's a lot 
more now, but I like the and the national priority projects. And they take, by the way, they take their name from they use the word priorities because they, and they on their websites they quote King a lot, you know, with his statements about the nation's priorities. How we need a radical reordering of, of our priorities. And what they did with that number, 151 billion, uh, last Christmas season, is they broke down other uses it could have been made with, and they found that you could have enrolled uh, 20 million plus kids uh, in Head Start. You could have provided health insurance for 91,000 kids. You could have built uh, more than a million public housing units. You could have hired 2,621,749 um, additional public school teachers for uh, one year. In uh, my home state where black kids uh, in Chicago attend schools with class sizes that are too big for students to receive individual attention, the state's share of the war's cost could have paid for the building of just you know 772 new elementary schools. The Chicago public school system could have hired 27,000 more teachers, and so on and so forth. Here's how uh, National Priorities Project breaks down the American tax bill for 2005. Okay, as of your last tax day, uh, by which time the costs of the Iraqi war uh, probably exceeded 200. Billion. So let, let's say you paid uh, Uncle Sam $1,000 last April. This is how your patriotic investment in the American public sector broke down. $300 went to the military, uh, which the federal government likes to call defense, uh, and which could probably more accurately be called empire, and internally, of course, people have in the pol in, within the Pentagon, most of it's for what they refer to as forward global force protection. Okay? It's a nice phrase. It's a little different than defense, okay? Though they will give you all these reasons why we're really defending ourselves whenever we're forwardly projecting uh, our force projections. Uh, you know, onward uh, Christian force projectors or something, right? Um, $203 will go to health care. Uh, all health spending by the federal government, including federal spending on Medi Medicare and Medicaid. $186 out of that, 1000 goes to pay interest on debt, uh, on, the, on the national debt, which costs the government, by the way, $317 billion per year. Uh, in other words, to pay off domestic international bondholders, okay, global uh, finance capital. 66 bucks goes to what the budget uh, uh, calculators call income security. Uh, including temporary, that's, that's, that's expenditures for the poor, uh, temporary assistance for needy families. That's what we used to call AFDC, Aid for Families with the Children. And they didn't like that, and they got rid of that, and they thought that sounded too nice, so they wanted to make sure everyone understood that welfare is temporary. So they, they, they renamed it Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. Uh, and also uh, supplementary security income and various different programs for families and kids. So you get 65 out of the $100, um, out of the $1,000 goes to that. 37 bucks on education. Uh, all federal expenditures on elementary, secondary, higher education. And you know, if you're fancy, you could tell me, and you'd be right, that most of the, most of the school funding in the country is, is, of course, local and, and state. I tell you, particularly in Illinois, it's really local. Um, and the quality of schools you go to really depends fundamentally on the, on the amount of property tax in your school, um, in, in your school district. Uh, 34 bucks the benefits for veterans, 27 bucks on nutri uh, nutrition spending, including food stamps, child nutrition programs, 21 bucks for housing, uh, 17 bucks for environmental protection. It's not a very high-ranking priority. Nine bucks for job training, and five dollars to uh, what they call other, uh, whatever that might be. <laughs> that includes a, a bit of corporate welfare, right? Um, now, so defense, quote unquote defense, which I, most of which I would call global forward force projection, is involved in maintaining more than 700 military bases located in nearly, nearly every nation in the world. And the source on that is, uh, is Chalmers Johnson's book, Sorrows of Empire. Defense outweighs education by 8 to 1, income security by more than 5 to 1, nutrition by 11 to 1, housing 14 to 1, job training 30 two to one. Military accounts for more than half of all discretionary uh, federal spending. Uh, defense budget is actually, you, you, you get the, fe you the official numbers and they put it like in the 400 billions. It's probably closer to 600 billion when it's properly calculated. Um, and when you delete, uh, when you, when you, when, and when you delete, and, and it's a much bigger percentage than the Bush 
won't ever admit, when you delete non-discretionary expenditures like Social Security, which the Bush administration, they always love to put in all of Social Security in their little pie charts to prove that defense is really a small expenditure, but it isn't. It's half of the discretionary expenditure. Um, and I, well, I could say more. This is a, there's a lot of games that go on. I used to have to study this about how exactly you calculate the federal budget. And don't be uh, too fooled by the number two ranking for health care. Most of that $202.74 is a for payment to a uh, corporate medical industrial complex. Uh, our per capita health expenditures actually in this country are huge, right? You hear all this other, you know, if you do things through the market and you do it privately, that's more efficient. We have absolutely massive, Krugman is very good on this and writes about this in the New York Times. We have very high per capita health expenditures, higher than those of, uh, of many countries with national health insurance plans like France and Germany, because we have very high doctor salaries and just these skyrocketing drug prices in this country where, you know, have almost zero countervailing power to flex against the market setting capacity of big pharma, right? A big, a big pharmaceutical uh, companies and, 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 and the costs are high because there's this flood, you know, if any of you have had anything with your health insurance company, I hope you have health insurance, right? You're not like 42 million, you don't. Just the paperwork, it's just endless and it piles up. Uh, and so you have this, this, this bloat um, and you have this legendary waste that people from the health industry will tell you about. And of course it comes at the expense of uh, salaries and benefits for nurses and orderlies and other medical staff. And nurses are some of those pivotal people who you really want to be happy on the job, particularly if you're in a hospital. One of the highest turnover occupations in the country right now because of salary issues and benefits issues and all that kind of stuff. So we really have this, um, this kind of guns or butter uh, trade-off in this, this country that King's still going on even worse in a lot of ways than in King's day, and very much what King was talking about. And of course, we might feel a little uh, less compelled to choose between guns and butter, butter if our policymakers weren't uh, so dedicated to, to piling ever more uh, cut caviar, right, on the plates of the already super opulent in what was already the industrialized world's most, most unequal and wealth top-heavy society, okay, under Bill Clinton, okay? That was already going on under Reagan and Bush one and Clinton before you had these extraordinary tax cuts which, you know, um, are sold to us as middle class tax cuts, but when you break them down, you find out that the wealthiest 1% re received about a quarter of the total um, cuts, and I could give you more statistics on that. Um, but I won't. Another place to look for some additional uh, anti-poverty dollars uh, might be in the nation's $50 billion prison industry, uh, which you know has just taken off in the last 20 years as the United States moved into leadership. You know, I mean, you know one area we're number, absolutely, unquestionably number one in, incarceration rate. Just astonishing incarceration rate. Um, when, this, uh, when I did this study, uh, still separate, unequal, uh, race, place, policy in the state of black Chicago, reporters would ask me, well, you know, because we had all these statistics, say, well, which, which of the statistics knocks you out the most? You know, I'm like, well, gee, I don't know. I mean, where do we start? Uh, you know, we had the, the four-year graduation rate, okay, for Latino and black kids in Chicago, which was, which was 40%, okay, 40% actually graduating from these these high schools that I write about in this book, segregated schools, with where the teachers are all burned out and everything's about standardized tests and everybody's bored to death and blah, blah, blah. Uh, we had the 15 neighborhoods. I, I, I kind of thought it was the 15 neighborhoods with a quarter of the kids beneath the poverty level. Um, then I kind of thought it was the fact that we had all these statistics, and those are just, you know, just some of the awful statistics, and they were from the peak of, of the longest peacetime expansion in the American economy since World War II. I mean, I say, that's what, that's what the worst thing is, right there. Because I know every one of these got worse because a recession came in and it got worse. And I thought, I thought for, uh, then I realized the one that got me the most, 20,000 more black males in Illinois uh, in prison than in the state public universities and we did a, I did a whole study on that in 2003 
uh, right down to the zip codes, where prisoners come from and where they're going. And, and more than a quarter of the prisoners in the whole state of Illinois are released to just um, 10 zip codes. We've got whole parts of the state, and we call it downstate. Everything that is in Chicago and Illinois is called downstate. I, did, I don't know if they have the upstate, downstate thing in Michigan with Detroit in Michigan, but it's what, what they call upstate in New York. You've got whole towns that just completely rely on basically young predominantly young black males from Chicago and a few other communities in the state as a raw material. They keep, keep their one thing that keeps, you know, I'm thinking of a town like Ina, Illinois, in the deep southern part of the state, where they used to farm and they used to have manufacturing and all this, and they got globalized and deindustrialized, and they had farm crisis, and the best place you can go and work is a prison, where you can, you can have just a high school degree. Uh, here, I've read accounts in Michigan of uh, Ionia, right? Uh, and organic sorts of prisons, and I, I read a piece in the Detroit News that came out in '03, and it was like, it's rural towns. I don't know if, if I own is really rural, resting on the uh, on on uh, their raw material of urban felons. I can say race once, you know. I was like, I was like, I'd like to break that down. I'm gonna get inside those statistics, but white rural towns, right? Where basically, their economic underpinning is this sort of steady flow of uh, this steady flow. Of um, of uh, of uh, black offenders, most of whom are nonviolent criminals, and most of whom are being incarcerated for things that you that in other advanced industrialized states you tell them, well, yeah, we lock people up for drugs, and they go, what are you talking about? Why do you do it? They look at you like you're nuts. I mean, there's a few things they do that with, like the like our working hours, but particularly incarcerating people for uh, for drug offenses, and it's of course very uh, very very um, racialized. Um, you know, this, this <clears throat> massive military spending to move off of prisons for a uh, time and its deadly uh, applications recently, you know, are just obviously really, really bad news uh, for a whole bunch of people, uh, like tens of thousands of Iraqis. Um, you all probably know, if you've read anything I've done, you're probably reading ZNet, which you might probably run across this statistic, which gets debated again and again, and I've mentioned it on my blog, and then people, but the conservative British medical journal, The Lancet, uh, has estimated 100,000 excess Iraqi civilian deaths between 2004 and October 2004. Anybody get into some of those uh, methodological issues and question that number? and you just want directly verifiable kills, okay, of, of civilian deaths, um, then your number's more like in the 20,000s. And, so you, you, and, and they don't get to count unless you actually have newspaper or other official media accounts and they're verified in more than one source. Then go to www.iraqibodycount, right? Uh, sort of heroic website where these people just comb everything and keep an ongoing database, so whether it's 100,000 or if it's 27,000, whatever exactly that number is, a whole bunch of Iraqis uh, have died that shouldn't have been. So I was always I was sort of, during the 2004 campaign when it, it, the, the American death count at that point was still something like 700 or something, I can't remember what it was, it was when the 2000 president, the pri Democratic primaries were going on, and, and Dean said, you know, and if, and if Bush hadn't fought the war, then there are 700 people that wouldn't have been dead otherwise, right? It's <laughs> American G. I just write. There's 700 people, but you know, depending if you, if you want to go with the Lancet statistic, you got to make that 100,000 and then 700, or whatever, 20,000. So, like a whole bunch of folks that wouldn't have been dead, and not all of them were Americans. Okay. Um, you know, uh, countless more Iraqis injured, otherwise, uh, otherwise uh, messed up in this whole thing uh, called op Operation. American Dominion. Uh, also among the toll, uh, what, are we at 2,000 yet? I mean, just any day we're going to pass 2,000. American GIs, uh, some more than 25,000 injured. I mean, some really just horrible. And it's sort of interesting to watch how the Pentagon and the White House sort of prefer. There's all this publicity about, you know, not wanting to see the coffins at all. But very much prefer to have people see coffins and sort of solemn patriotic rituals over the really really unpleasant shots of people with missing limbs. And there's more of them than there's ever been with these, with these mines and these new technologies for saving people. There's just horrific types of uh, injuries that are people suffering, in some ways almost worse uh, when, when you get down to it than, than, the, uh, than the GI deaths. 
And, you know, we have this uncounted mass uh, so far of soldiers that are definitely going to be coming back with depleted uranium poisoning and, of course, post-traumatic and other disorders leading GI return communities, which are very much working class communities. The New York Times did a piece on uh, the socioeconomic composition of the military uh, in the early 21st century, and it's just amazing how just pervasively working class it is now to the point there's just almost no one else but working class people. Even the officer positions now are people whose socioeconomic origins are, are, are more... Um, are more blue collar. And so these communities are, are dealing, uh, and they always do, with mental health and family violence problems, right, uh, when, as, as people come back from war. And of course, this dovetails with the, uh, with the Bush administration, and it's just ongoing tax cutting mania, actually cutting veterans' benefits. And of course, the line being that the, uh, you know, the, the, the greatest the World War II generation is retiring and all that kind of stuff. Um, Millions of Americans in the nation's overall social health paying a really big opportunity cost for the money their government spends on war instead of social uplift. But there's one group, I've been tracking this, uh, of Americans for whom uh, King's perverted priorities are really good news, and that's leading defense, defense investors, and leading investors in American defense corporations. I'll never forget earlier this year running across a CNN money dispatch uh, I mean, it just came on my, you know, it was linked right off of my Yahoo or whatever. As you know, you get these like, you know, check your stock account and, you know, investment advice. And, and you'll read a CNN money uh, bit, a ditty on, on some aspect of, of investment. And it was titled, Wall Street Has Embraced Defense Stocks. And it reported that military equities had become a shining jewel within a broadly bad stock market. The reason CNN money pointed out is fairly simple. The ongoing military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, not to mention an increased focus on homeland security. Shares of the 20 U.S.-based defense companies with a market value of at least $1 billion are up 30% CNN noted during the last 12 months, blah, 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 compared to just, you know, a 2% gain in the SIP. So, you know, at least, you know, that's, that may be cold comfort if you, if you have a cousin that's coming back with a missing leg or something like that, you know, help him out. You can help rebuild his... Uh, his uh, his home, you know, and fix the staircase or something with uh, with money that you make from investing in Boeing or Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin or you know just uh, fill in the bank. So in a generally bad or weak investment climate, CNN reported one sector has held up quite well, and it's helping to prove that one of the most overused cliches of professional sports is actually applicable to investing. You can't you can't win without a good defense. So, and by the way, I hope the White Sox are uh, winning with a good defense and a good offense right now, being a South Side Chicago or myself. Um, you know, and so I better wrap up, and I've got two other points. Uh, where is the left, supposedly democratic opposition to all this uh, empire and inequality, to all to King's uh, triple? evils, or what he referred to as his triplets, militarism, uh, economic exploitation, and racism. Uh, Democratic candidate Kerry uh, defied his own voter base, and including his own delegates in the Fleet Center in Boston last fall, by refusing to embrace uh, withdrawal from uh, the occupation of Iraq. Uh, his essential message, as far as I could make it out in foreign policy terms, was that he was the better, more sophisticated military imperialist than, than Bush. Uh, you know, and this message was just, you know, was just all over the place. It was reinforced by proud references to, you know, it was almost like, vote for me. I actually physically participated in the crucifixion of Southeast Asia in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, you know, these references to his direct youthful engagement in the war in Vietnam. Uh, I loved when he, you know, he accepted his nomination speech, right, with a salute. Remember that? You know, and reported to duty. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I was, I caught hell because I was one of the guys, I did Chomsky and Zinn on ZNet and other places and got in debates, said, look, if you're in a swing state, Bush is just too dangerous, okay? I mean, if you're in Michigan, I was in Illinois, so it didn't really matter what I did, but, but if you're in a swing state, I mean, Bush really is, you know, he's, he's nuts, okay? And, and you know, he, he, I, I, Nader described him accurately, I thought, which I thought sort of made Nader's campaign in some ways kind of ironic as a messianic militarist. He said that repeatedly over and over again. He said, you know, look, he's a messianic militarist. So if you're in Michigan or Iowa or, or, or a swing state, 
probably shouldn't vote for, for Ralph this time around, right? So, I mean, I did that. But, boy, was I, you know, you're about holding your nose. I mean, I was, this was, you know, with this, I had this, and I had the clips on under, and I wasn't looking, I couldn't look at him much uh, either. I mean, the, the Onion had this hilarious piece about the Kerry campaign where he would show up in, like, factory parking lots, but he, but he was campaigning from a rolling yacht, you know, he was all dressed up like a New England yachtsman. He had this sort of aristocratic lilt to his voice. And, you know, blue-collar workers were coming out of auto plants and looking at him like, what? And he's saying, you know, you know, vote for me. And the Democratic Party is the party of the workers and all this kind of business. Um, you know, and regarding domestic policy, uh, Kerry had nothing much at all to say about poverty, okay, in, in, in the world's richest nation. Uh, everything was, it was the middle class, the middle class, the middle class. It was always about the plight of the middle class. Well, that's what his advisors were telling him to do, but I really think he could have made a lot more hay. I mean, I know a whole bunch of people in Chicago that were like wanting him to, to say something about poverty. And, you know, by the time his campaign is going, there really is an increase in poverty, and particularly child poverty. And it was a, it was a really big issue, and he stayed away with it. Uh, Kerry would have been the second richest president since Kennedy, incidentally. I mean, he would have been, you know, partially because of who he married, right? I mean, because of, because of marrying into the Heinz Ford. I mean, he would have been stupendously wealthy. Uh, and consistent with that, and maybe this is a cheap shot, okay? So I'm not saying necessarily because of that, but consistent with that, he was really uh, silent about inequality and what it does to, uh, to the country and what it does to democracy. Um, and he, I wrote a piece that some, I think was in Dissident Voice at one point where I, I, I talked about how he actually said, and maybe it was his audience because he, he was trying to get money and he was in New York and he was talking to a bunch of big fat cats and he was at some uh, cocktail dinner. Or no, I think it was a breakfast thing. You know, he was doing, he was, he was, you know, he was drumming up dough. That's what you got to do. You can't run a campaign without dough in America. And he said, I am not a redistribution. Democrat. Let me repeat that. I am not a Regents distribution Democrat, right? Well, you know, if you agree with Aristotle and Chomsky and Thomas Jefferson and, and for that matter, you know, little old me, uh, you know, then you're not, then the, the response to that was, then, sir, you are not a Democrat at all, right? Because, I mean, you have 1% owning 40% of the wealth. I mean, the, the democracy gets a little iffy, okay? Under <laughs> those circumstances, right? I mean, you own 40% of the wealth. What, what percentage of the policymakers and the politicians? Do you own? He was just sort of uh, proud of that, um, the way he talked about it. And you know, last spring, not a single Democratic senator voted against Bush's request for an additional $82 billion to continue the Iraq occupation. Uh, Obama, who everybody I worked with in Chicago wanted to see as just this like flaming peace and justice activist, you know, at heart. But you know, he's just, but he's got to get into the White House. It's, you know, it's like, and I always had this kind of like Buddhist comeback line. It says, you know, the, the path is the way. I mean, it's, <laughs> you, you do all these things, rationalize the ends, and then you get there, and you are the way you got there, right? And, and Obama, uh, who really is a, a really brilliant guy, he used to, they, we have various events with the league, and I sort of got to know him a little bit, but um, Obama, uh, said that we had no choice, you know, but to sustain the operation, and uh, you know, he even approved the appointment of the mendacious Petro imperialist Condoleezza Chevron Rice. Uh, <laughs> you know, she has, she had. I think they had to change it, but she she had a Chevron to named after there was there was called the Condoleezza Rice. Uh, you know, and she, who was a really key player, you know, uh, kind of, okay, a little bit in the invasion of Iraq in the first place. And he approved the, the appointment of her as of all things, right, the Secretary of State. He's <laughs> in charge of diplomacy, right? Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's funny. You know, Wolfowitz gets to do like McNamara, right? the Vietnam, go off, you know, go, go run the World Bank right now, right? She becomes the, the chief architect of American diplomacy. And I would jump up and down and complain that at the Urban League and people tell me to shut up and, you know, it's just great, it's, you know, whatever, so. Um, you know, uh, there's this, you hear this on the left and, uh, and you hear this in progressive circles all the time, there's this widely advertised lament, and this is my, uh, really my last point, uh, that, that this, that, that reordering, that radical reordering that King wanted to do in the 60s um, is impossible because we have this powerless and cash-strapped state sector. Government, you know, can't really do anything anymore. It doesn't have the strength, it doesn't have the legitimacy, it doesn't have the money, it doesn't have the wherewithal 
uh, to carry out key objectives. And I sort of hear that in line and I say, well, tell it, you know, to the two million uh, people behind bars in the country uh, who are incarcerated. That's two million people. That's unmatched globally, at least in terms of its, its the incarceration rate is unmatched, okay? Incarcerated at about 35000 to forty thousand dollars a year, right? Which is kind of interesting because it costs seven to eight thousand a year, at least in Illinois, to educate a kid. But we pay about thirty-five thousand to incarcerate somebody. Um, and I think this whole kind of lament that, you know, that that government is too weak, you know, globalization has so completely marginalized the public sector, and there, there's no state left anymore that we can do anything positive or progressive with anymore. You know, is to to a certain extent myth, um, and particularly you see it that way when you start asking whose objectives government can and whose objectives government can't carry out. We're the wealthiest nation on the earth. Okay, fine, Norway's, Norway's got a higher per capita. So the second wealthiest nation on earth. Um, the, pu the public sector lacks the money to properly fund education for all the, the country's kids, can't provide universal health coverage, uh, can't match unemployment benefits to the numbers out of work. We did studies on that. I mean, it's just a chronic issue. Uh, lacks their claims to lack the money for a meaningful rehabilitation and reentry services for just this, this army of ex-offenders that it just spits out again and again, right back into the same hyper-segregated, extremely uh, economically disadvantaged neighborhoods that they came from. And guess what? Now, on top of everything else, they have felony records. And so, gee, how come the black male recidivism rate out of Illinois prisons is more than 50%, right? Uh, but we don't have any money to take care of any of that. I, mean, I could just go on and on. It's just it's the list. I studied this for a living for five years of unmet civic needs and social needs and so on and so forth. But listen to the things our public sector can pay for. It can afford to spend trillions on tax cuts for the top 1% disingenuously sold as economic stimulus for the, uh, and, and as helping the middle class spend more on the military than all of America's possible military enemies combined many times over along the way providing this huge subsidy transfer payment to high tech industry through the, through the, through the Pentagon system. I said that a lot of stuff, the health care expenditures were a transfer to uh, to, uh, to, to, the, to, to, to medical corporations and the pharmaceutical corporations. Say, uh, a similar point can certainly be made about the defense budget. Um, it can afford hundreds of billions and perhaps more than a trillion dollars before it's all over for invading and occupying on completely false premises, you know, this distant, already devastated nation that posed minimal risk, if any risk at all, to the United States. Europe, and even to, at that time, before Iraq was invaded, to its own neighbors, and which, of course, we all know had really nothing to do with 9-11 or with extremist fundamentalist Islam at all. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, still, just last week, Bush again and again trying to make the 9-11 connection, just sort of beat it, even as people, it's clear, aren't buying it anymore. It's just he's going to live and die with this thing uh, to connect uh, the invasion of Iraq with 9-11. Uh, we can afford to incarcerate a greater share of our population, oh, it's very racially disparate, okay, than, than any nation in history. We can spend hundreds of millions each year on various types of corporate welfare and subsidies to private industry. I guess what I'm trying to say, the American public sector is, is weak and cash-strapped when it comes to social democracy for the people, uh, but its cup runs over in you know, really powerful ways when it comes to meeting the needs of wealth and social disparity and inequality um, uh, and, and empire. And it's really useful to keep that distinction in mind when we hear people like uh, Grover Norquist, you know, who's this big tax cut maven in the Republican Party, sort of the guru of tax policy on the right uh, in recent years. It's, it's very useful to keep that distinction in mind when you hear guys like him say, and this is a quote from Norquist, I want to cut government in half in 25 years. I want to get it down to the size where we can drown it uh, in the bathtub. He wants to starve the beast, the beast of the public sector of the state. You know, when Norquist and people like him say they want to starve the beast of government, always remember, they want to starve you know, uh, one, some parts of government. They target some parts of government for malnourishment. 
a lot more energetically than others. They're concerned to dismantle some parts of the public sector. They're, they they want to get rid of the parts of the public sector that serve social and democratic needs of the non-affluent majority. The, the parts of the public sector that punish the poor and that serve the needs of the wealthy and that distribute wealth upward to them, you know, are just fine. They want to defund what uh, the, he died last year, the late great uh, French sociologist Pierre uh, Bordeaux referred to as the left hand of the state. Okay? That's what, when they say they want to starve the beast, meaning the government, they want to starve the left hand of government. Okay? The programs and the services that embody past victories by popular social movements. But you know, they reserve the right hand of the state, the parts that provide service and welfare and nice things and, and love and comfort to the rich and the privileged few. Uh, one of the things I've noticed in the last few years is how brilliant the right is at framing issues. And they will have you believe that, that the debate in America is between sort of evil regulatory statist socialists, right, who want to squelch like the life out of America with this, the dead hand of Stalinist state control of everything, right? On one hand, and you know, so sort of it's like state policy versus what they want, which is to free everybody, which is the market. And they, they set up this fascinating distinction between the state and the market, right? And what I always find interesting in it, and this resonates in American history going all the way back to the beginning, which a lot of debates which you think are like that are really a debate between two different versions of state policy, right? A state policy that would be more, more interested in helping broad masses of people, right? And a, sta uh, and a state policy, that would, a governmental policy that is all about distributing wealth and power further upward and, and punishing uh, people at the bottom. I sort of, sort of do that analysis with a lot of debates with American history going all the way, really back to the beginning of what was the difference between, well, I won't even go there. Um, so, you know, always keep that, that in mind. They want to reserve um, uh, the right hand of the state, the parts that provide service and welfare to the privileged few, and, and, uh, and they, they want to tear down the, the parts of the government that help uh, non-affluent uh, people. And, uh, you know, their wishes are being met to no small extent, uh, particularly under the cover of this uh, terror and with help from uh, and just this, this kind of spineless democratic non opposition uh, is what I call now the radically, the radical Republicans, the radically regressive and repressive Republicans uh, are stripping government of its positive and social and democratic aspects. Uh, American public policy toward the poor and toward the disadvantaged is increasingly being reduced to policing um, and repressing functions. Uh, and they're expanding, uh, per, you know, increasingly who the black or of like the south side of Chicago or parts of Detroit interact within the public sector is it's not the teacher, it's not the social worker, it's not the uh, welfare case worker, whatever. It's the parole agent, it's the cop, it's the prison guard, and it's the warden. And of course, sometimes it's the drill sergeant, and there you actually can get like alternatively sentenced into Iraq, you know, uh, amazingly enough, right? Um, uh, American policy towards the poor is increasingly being reduced to that state and society are criminalizing and deepening social inequality and related social problems. Um, and we have this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, viciously circular types of policies where we imprison people, disabling them yet further in the labor market, and then we spit them back out and they commit new drug crimes, which are often sort of economic crimes, and they're back in all over again. We have these kind of complexes uh, that just drive themselves in self-justifying kinds of ways. And we're seeing that in Iraq right now, right? Where Why are we there? Well, whatever reasons we were there for in the first place, now we now it's just, okay, you know, we sort of said WMD, we said uh, it was to give freedom to the Iraqis, and now, now it's like, well, it really is a terrorist uh, a bonanza land now, right? Yeah, Be because we made it such, right? And, and, and the whole, it's so resonant of Vietnam, or it reminds me, you know, the credibility argument now, right? So they've, they've already, I, I get the sense they've crossed that point where they know this is a fiasco, it's a quagmire, it's going to continue that way, right? And it's just a question how many more people are going to die before they can just openly sort of admit that, right? And, and so they're already talking amongst themselves about disengagement. But, you know, we've got to stay strong, we've got to stay manly, you know, we can't withdraw from Iraq. You know, we, you know, the whole thing might be a rape, but we can't call the rape off quite yet. 
Um, and there's this whole thing, you know you're in trouble when the argument is that you, well, if we, if we stopped now, we'd be saying that the people who died already died for nothing, right? Oh, my God, you know, watch out. So, that, so now 2,000 more have to die for nothing, right? Then it'll be 4,000 people who you can't say died for nothing, right? And then it'll be 6,000, know, then, then you can never stop. So I guess we'll all have to die. But though, as we were discussing before, we're apparently all going to die from avian flu like in a month anyway, so it's, it's all over. <laughs> Um, now I love the way news, you know, one way you can, the one way news just sort of like throws, of, treats things as just like, regardless of what you think, this is happening anyway, it doesn't matter, you're, you're just, that's one of the things I picked up in the Iraq media coverage was like, okay, yeah, 50% of the people are against this, 15 people just marched against it, it was like the biggest day of preemptive anti-war demonstration that ever existed in the history of the human race. This is where the New York Times, they go, but the war train has already left the stations. This is happening anyway. Um, uh, market discipline and fiscal retrenchment are meant for the poor and the powerless. It's only the left hand of the state that must be starved. The rich and the powerful few are mainly from market strictioners and from the sharpening of the public fiscal knife. They are free to gorge themselves in the public trough, profiting from amply fed and murderously flexing right hand of the racist, imperial, and mass incarceratory state. How's that for some, some uh, warned over uh, 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 post-1960s uh, left-wing discourse there? Um, King used to talk about the spiritual death uh, of the nation. He used to talk about when, um, uh, when, we, when we're spending money this kind of way while kids are on the west side of Chicago or the east side of Detroit or in Bedford-Stuyvesant or in Compton or in Watts or in wherever. Or in, for that matter, places like Grand Rapids. I, one thing I was sort of, in my whole time studying poverty, like everything's always Chicago, one of the huge cities, and there's all these other concentrations that, like nobody knows about, like in Illinois, like Rock Island, or like parts of Peoria, or East St. Louis. And can you talk about the spiritual death of, of, of a nation when, when it invests in, uh, in means of destruction and, and overseas conquest and, and murder um, in, instead of addressing those kinds of needs? Um, um, and he used to talk about how America needs to get on what he referred to as the right side of the world. We need to get on the right side of history. Well, I think we're looking at the spiritual, the potential, the possible, if we're not careful, spiritual death of a nation, and we do need to get on the right side of uh, world history. Uh, the terrible social and health consequences at home and abroad are clear for all who care to look. Uh, on that note, I better, I've already taken too much time, I better stop. Jeff. Oh, by the way, um, I do have, I'm really not here.